What's up, Cameo Nation? We are here at the Westgate Las Vegas with Cameo. It's been 30 years since Word Up was released, and so we're here to talk to uh, Larry Blackman, Jonathan Moffitt, Jeff Nelson, Tommy Jenkins, and Anthony Lockett about Word Up and to answer some of your questions. So, Larry, could you uh, talk a little bit about Word Up and 30 years and this Man, very important Word. milestone? Word Up was music before its time, okay? We always made it a point to have our own style of not just R&B, but contemporary urban music. And uh, every time I hear Word Up, it's like the first day I heard it. And uh, there's a little story I'm going to tell you about it. Um, we were in the studio, and the managing director of the UK branch of Polydor was there in uh, New York. And uh, we were at Wydrasonic Studios, and the president of Polygram in New York, Dick Asher, was there, along with Tommy, I believe Nathan was there mm -hmm. also. And it was so weird because the song played, and all of a sudden there's silence. Mm -hmm. And then the managing director of the UK stood up and said, that's a smash. And then Dick Asher stood up and said, that's a smash <laughs> afterwards. But it was obvious that, that Dick Asher didn't necessarily get it as much as, uh, I believe his name was David. David, yes. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And, um, you know, he had uh, come up through the ranks in the UK International. And he felt that uh, Word Up was that, that kind of significant, uh, impactful hit. And, and we felt that way as well. It just sounded good and uh, it was before its time, you know, and it has its, um, you can play Word Up any place, anywhere. And someone is going to be grooving and bobbing their head and, and the whole thing. But, uh, and our sound as well, you know, was unique. I haven't heard another one like it and we probably won't hear another one like it in the future. It was that uh, significant for us, do you? Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's funny because uh, the label here in the States just did not believe that it was going to do nothing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And until David said, that's a hit, <laughs> then all of a sudden, you know, oh yeah, the Larry Tate, board. you know. <laughs> <laughs> it was a Larry Tate moment. You know, we, we make reference to it. <laughs> Larry Tate on Bewitched, you know, the series, the uh, yeah. advertising agency. The guy says, oh, yeah. well, I don't like that. The guy says, oh, I like it. Oh, yeah, I love it. You know, <laughs> kind of thing. But um, uh, it was uh, revolutionary, I think. And uh, a lot of the fans that come to see us, that's the first ex uh, exposure that they have the cameo. A lot of, uh, a lot of crossover fans, you know. Uh, we've been doing music 10 years prior to that and had pretty much, you know, successful, been yeah, pretty successful, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and, uh, but Word Up was revolutionary in that the sounds that we employed in the song were very different at the time. We, we had many uh, big stars reference uh, the snare sounds and the guitar sounds and, the, you know, the drum sounds and everything that was so different about a black group coming out with that kind of stuff, you know, kind of, uh, uh, sounds mm -hmm. at the time so we uh, we kind of knew we had something and you never know how big it's gonna get but it was a turning point in our uh, careers for sure. people aren't even aware that that's not an actual snare we created that at Quadrasonic right. studio we took a microphone and put it in the fire escape the staircase which was all cement and then I got six or seven of us all together and, and clapped. we clapped. Mm -hmm. And so we processed, processed that in the studio and that created a, a snare that you've heard on NFL Sunday, um, a, a bunch of songs. Yeah, all kinds of a bunch of, you know, of course we recognize it immediately, okay? But uh, you don't have to actually use a snare to, uh, to have a snare sound. And the same goes with other sounds as well. Well, excellent. Uh, we've got some people tuning in and a asking their questions. Some people have asked about uh, a story I'm sure you've told a million times. What is the deal with the red codpiece? 
if you don't mind addressing that for a moment. Well, when we started, okay, um, I was playing drums behind a lot of singing <laughs> groups, and they would use Bernard Johnson, who was the premier uh, costume designer for you know singing groups. It was like if you got to the point where you could hire Bernard Johnson, then you knew you made it. And that was always a, a, uh, a uh, goal for us. And so Bernard created these outfits for us, and all of them had cod pieces, rhinestone, uh, other you know material. But we all had one. And so on Word Up, Toys Anderson was the. Uh, and uh, I'm standing on line behind the dancers and everybody else to get my costume. And uh, there was this big box, and I opened the box and closed it fast <laughs> and went on to the dressing room. And I said, guys, look at what Toys wants me to wear. And uh, I think the, the comments were, man, balls out, man, go for it, you know? <laughs> I mean, seriously. I mean, so what was I supposed to do? I'm directing the video. Where, what was I supposed to say? No, I'm not gonna wear this. So I wore it, and, and the rest is history. Uh, in the UK, it was a smash also, made paid six. And the, uh, what magazine is that? And, uh, uh, the Sun, or the Daily the, Mail. Or yeah, the, yes, I forget the name of it. Yeah. But paid six was the gossip uh, uh, scuttlebutt page about uh, celebrity happenings. And uh, we all happened to be at a Chinese restaurant called Golden Earth. And uh, that night, Prince, Andrew was there, and I think he had a couple of uh, bottles, uh, bottles of sake too many. But he came over to us and said, man, I love you guys stuff, man. Where's your red cup? And everybody always asks about that thing, no matter, you know. And um, man, it's been alive now for how many years? <laughs> <laughs> 30 years today. 30 years, yeah. actually, yeah. that's, that's yeah. correct. Can't kill it. <laughs> no, no. no, and, uh, and uh, I would love, love not to wear it, but you know, it creates, you know, people want to know where it is, you know, they, they enjoy it. But you guys have a lot of fashion that you've done through the years. Oh, all yes. your different videos oh, yes. and yeah. all the different, you know, even here in your Las Vegas residency, you're, you're, you know, you guys are showing the fashion up on the stage. Like, I don't think people realize that, you know, you guys are still making fashion statements every single night. Indeed. Uh, we used uh, Jean-Paul yeah, Gaultier yeah. before Madonna. Actually, that's how she found out about him. And then we had the pleasure of meeting him in uh, London at the, uh, we were playing, no, it was London, oh, oh, oh. at the Wembley Arena. Mm -hmm. And he said, Larry, I'll create something special for you. And we were playing Paris the next week, and he invited us over to the to his, to his spring or summer fashion yeah. show, and we were playing at the Zenith, which was right next door. And, uh, and Jean-Paul took us to the, uh, to his boutique, uh, what is it called? Uh, and then his work room. Yeah, and he gave us a bunch of stuff. Gave us a bunch of, and gave us 50% <laughs> off of everything in the stores, you know? And he's been a, 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 you know, a close associate and friend ever since. Wow. Uh, Cameo fan K wants to know, what is the key to longevity? You guys seem to be so, uh, young and sprightly on stage, so there must be some kind of uh, <laughs> secret that you're withholding from everyone. It's, it's the music. <laughs> it's the music. Wow. It's the music. You know, it, it has to be. You know, uh, it, there's a magic that happens between the audience and the group. Um, and I, I really have, that's my theory, that it has more to do with the exchange of energy and the music you're playing, the response from the audience, and I think it has a magic effect on you, you know, it keeps you youthful. I, I think there's a shared aesthetic too that that really makes itself evident when we get on stage and we all come together, that it's almost that, that the cameo sound is a philosophy that's all a part of our life and a part of our entire musical experience. And uh, so, you know, embracing that, I think helps keep the group fresh, vibrant, and alive all the time because we're making it up as we go along. It's our thing, you know. Right. We're not doing anyone else's thing. That's true. That's true. That's right. 
it's love, you know. Yeah, when you're you gotta what you love, love what you do. I mean, that's that. Yes, I mean, it's the same thing if you were in a regular, you know, businessman or whatever you did for a living. If you loved it, then you would be enthusiastic. You would look forward to it every day. It's not work. You know, it would yeah. be yeah. Right. It's not something you dread going to or uh, no. It's it's we just happen to be musicians. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that the, all these elements come together, I think, uh, makes. The, the 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 overall effect of very unique and one of a kind when you bring the elements of rock jazz funk R and B all classical all of it is kind of mixed up in this cameo stew we're not we're not beholden to any one particular style right. we can branch off and do whatever it is that we feel in the moment you're only as old as your soul and your spirit you feel what you do you love what you do to keep you young keep you breathing, yeah. keep you alive, keep well, your energy sir. up. Mm -hmm. That's right. about the, it's not about the numbers of the age, it's yeah. about the, mm -hmm. the feeling of the spirit and the soul. You think young, you continue to think young, you love and you li live and thrive in what you do, and, and with, with love and, and, uh, ad and adoration for the gift of what you do, you'll stay young. And that's what we do as musicians and creative people. Our creativity keeps us young, and it, it feeds our spirit to stay young. So we don't age. So that's it. Good night. That's a secret to longevity. longevity. Wow. Yeah. We, we answered it right here on stage. That's wonderful. Well, I definitely know Word Up has been a young style song for a long, long time. And a lot of other bands and, you know, multiple different, you know. Clearly every wedding band in America. Yeah. Every, I mean, it's, it makes you want to move. It makes you want to dance. It makes you want to have a good time. Like, you know, you guys saying how much the music means to you and it keeps you young. This, the music that you produce and the music that you create every night is still relevant. You know, everyone's, you know, funk is alive. Like it's, you know, it's something that you feel when you hear it. So that's right. it's nice to have you guys performing, you know, Thursday all the way through Sunday, pretty much every week here in Las mm -hmm. Vegas. Yeah. So if anybody's out there checking this out and you happen to be in Las Vegas, uh, don't miss it. Come see yeah. us. All right, uh, Cameo fan Ryan wants to know, how would you define the essence of cameosis? Hmm. And how does well, it fit Well, I think Jeff just <laughs> described it quite well. I think so, Yeah, too. so that, that is cameosis yeah, right there? that's right. Indeed, indeed. All right, let's see, it's what other questions lifestyle. do we have? Mm -hmm. Uh, Rial has a comment, so glad you're all committed to this residency at the Westgate. That's very nice. Ricky, hey guys, how has George Clinton and P-Funk affected y'all? Oh, man. Well, you know, we, we all listen to, we've been listening to George Clinton, you know, from, you know, older adolescence on, and George did a lot of interesting things. And it's impossible not to be affected by music that you hear throughout your formative years. So how much, we've never, sat down to try to copy but I'm sure you know a lot of the grooves that George did and a lot of the arrangements certainly have you know made an impression upon us to the point of you know you're going to hear that funk in there and funk is not necessarily fast music it's not slow music uh, funk is just in, I mean, like, you know, reggae. Reggae is funky. I've heard some slow songs in mid-tempo that I would consider to be funky, okay? And we call reggae the rhythm of life because it's continuous and it's exactly on time. Each time you know where it's coming. So, you know, from a, mus a musician's perspective, you know, um, <coughs> You know, that's what funk is about. You know, in a way, it's kind of like asking, well, how do you think that the Grateful Dead influenced Aerosmith? You know, I mean, it's kind of the same kind of question. Well, you know, I'm sure we all listened to the music, we heard it as we went along, but it just was a part of the overall, everything coming in, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. To add further what Larry was speaking of, my philosophy is always that funk is never in a hurry. 
Funk is not nerdy. Neither is Funk. Neither is he. Neither is he. <laughs> 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 he just gave us some <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're so late in, in this broadcast. Funk is never nerdy. Yeah. Funk takes his time. Am I right? That's right. Yeah, that's that's right. right. His own time right. and his own right. groove. That's, that's the first time I've And ever he lives heard it yeah, that that's way. Yeah. And, and, and like really, that. that's, that's, that's nail on the head kind of uh, philosophy yeah. there. Just mm -hmm. to go back a little bit about George, uh, that was our first tour uh, exactly. in 1978, I think. Yes. It first came out, and that was our first tour. And George, of course, was huge. You know, uh, the flashlight and the, yes. the, the, the mothership, uh, the mothership and the whole tour. big yes. stadium kind of thing. It was amazing for 20-something-year-old dudes to go and, and be on this world tour for a year. Uh, in, in the belly of the beast, so to speak. You know, it was amazing. 20 minutes. Yeah, 20 <laughs> minutes on stage. And we did so well during those, during that time. The Barcades were, were going on before George. We opened up for 20 minutes. As the tour went along, we wound up switching with the Barcades. And we went on before George and the Barcades wound up over there. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, our thing was unique not that we copied anything but we were definitely this uh, our stage thing was always balls out you know <laughs> we were always that way and i guess that translated and, and if, if any for any reason if we related to george in any kind of way it was the way that that stage thing, just everything happening. You know, you didn't know. You look over here, you see somebody doing something. Over here, you see another thing. Your eyes were always like this. You were entertaining, you know. That's where it was. If we, you know, other, um, irrespective of the music, you know. That was a other thing. Interesting. Uh, we're getting a lot of Cameo fans asking about new music. We, we, we are in the process of completing a new body of work, okay? I believe we will release the live at the Westgate uh, recording first and then that one because uh, Sirius Radio re, uh, recorded our show. They've been playing it on The Groove, is it? Tommy? It's the Groove. Yeah, it's the Groove. The groove. Mm -hmm. And it's been getting a phenomenal response. So songs that we did not record on our first live album some years ago, uh, you know, people have asked for some of the songs that are not singles. There are certain cameo songs you have to play, but we intend to add the ones that were not singles that true cameo fans want to hear. And uh, we're gonna make that available, release that, and then release the uh, new body of work. And for any cameo fan, uh, you know that we have an eclectic style, you know, not one that you can predict, okay? And I, and not hating on the current music in any way, shape, or form. It's just, it doesn't have the same redeeming value that our music have had, we found, okay? So that's something to look forward to. There's going to be a rebroadcast of that. Yeah, it's uh, actually yeah, it's, uh, it's this, well. Sunday. Oh, yeah. Yeah. this Sunday. It's this Sunday. Uh, let's see. No, it is tomorrow. Yeah. You're right. I'm sorry. Okay. Tomorrow, May 28th, from five okay. to seven p.m. Eastern yeah. Standard Time on Groove. Great. 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 So listen, everyone, listen, everybody. Yeah. And it's the entire yeah. show, so it's yes. a really yeah. great experience. If you can't get to Vegas, you know, right away, and you you want to come and see us, maybe later this summer, you can check it check it out. Listen to listen to cameo, hear the hits, and hopefully come out and, and see us in person. Indeed. Yeah, indeed. Well, I'd like to take a moment to just go individually and uh, have each of you share uh, your favorite cameo story. Be it something that mm. happened uh, backstage, <laughs> or you know, one that's relatively PG. Start at yeah. that side. Uh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So we're just gonna move on <laughs> over. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of my stories is when I first got in the band, we, uh, my first show that I did with Cameo, actually I think it was the second show, but anyway, we went out, we were traveling in Illinois and it was really, really, really a bad wind in New York. And I'm from a, a country town, like not, I I live in, don't live in Atlanta, Georgia, but I'm from Georgia. But the town I'm from is called Winston, so, you know, me going to New York in two foot of snow is like I, nothing I've never seen before. <laughs> so we were riding down the highway on our bus, and 
and uh, everything. And the weather was real bad. And so, like, and then we end up having an accident. We end up in an area called Winston, Illinois, uh, out of all things. Mm -hmm. But we flipped and, and ended up on the other side of the freeway, going the opposite way. The thing that's, that that reminds me of that that we had some, you know, of course that was a scary moment. The bus flipped over. We were all kind of knocked out, uh, knocked unconscious for a moment. Then we woke up. The thing that was hilarious about it, one of the uh, one of my favorite singers, who's no longer with us, is Wayne Cooper, and he always hogged the back seat of the bus because the, the, the bus, the type of bus we had, you know, the back row you had the whole back row, but it was next to the toilet tree. <laughs> so when it flipped and did whatever it did, everything came out of it. He got, he took a bath. <laughs> Think about it. So that just just one of those things that's just quite hilarious to me. And I got many more, but I'll stop with that. One. But we, we love we love Wayne. We really miss Wayne. Great, great, great soprano. And this awesome dude in terms of singing, he was a wonderful guy. So we love you, Wayne. I'm gonna turn over Absolutely. to Tommy T. Oh, I got nothing. <laughs> no, you know I don't I don't. Uh, I, it's it's funny. I'm, while Anthony was talking, I was trying to recall something that was that stood out, you know, in my mind in terms of uh, anything significant that I could share in a PG uh, situation. <laughs> 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 <Yeah>. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, I fell off the stage. No, no. Oh, I don't remember doing that. Oh, oh, Aaron. Oh my God. We were, we were in. Aaron, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, that, that's happened a couple of times. Yeah, that happened a couple of times, man. Uh, oh, yeah. The last one was in uh, London. He, yes. He, he and fell over the table, Yeah, he right? walked right off the, the edge of the stage to the orchestra pit. And, didn't he uh, trip over the... And he had 11 stitches that night. He tripped yeah. over a monitor, right? No, he didn't trip over. He just... <laughs> oh, my gosh. Like, where he was going. The only and, thing uh, I can say is the most significant thing that ever happened to me was when I first heard my song on the radio. First heard the first Rick and Mortis in New York City. I grew up in Jersey, and you know I'm driving down the street, and you know Frankie Crocker, who was a DJ at the time on WBLS uh, in New York. You know he had this thing called World Premiere. You know mm -hmm. whenever you heard that, you knew there was going to be something that you never heard, and was very special to him or the radio station. And when I don't see what you want, I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> I pull the car over and go, wow, uh, you know, uh, that's that was, that's, that's the moment, you know, and I'm sure every musician or every, anybody who's ever heard their, their record for the first time is a very special moment, you know, but it just happened to me, so I'm talking about it, thank you. <laughs> we got a comment from Carla who says, your mother's watching Tommy, keep it PG. <laughs> <laughs> that's your sister, Carla. Oh, hey, hey, Carla. <laughs> Oh, my God, Lamont says you guys are all looking that. young. That's good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. fantastic. You guys right. were, what, six months old when you when <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Larry, do you got a, a story well, you feel like sharing? It's similar to, uh, to, to what uh, Tommy was expressing. I was, you know, in the evenings, um, I would work at this uh, clothing shop. Okay, I was a salesman there, and and I was fitting a customer, and um, I didn't expect it because um, Casablanca Records didn't tell us when the, the single was going to come out. And I heard the world premiere, and then I heard as Tommy did that thing start. And I asked an associate there in the store if he would finish, you know, accommodating the customer I was fitting. And went to my locker, got my stuff, and walked out. <laughs> and that is a true story. And never look back. Oh, it was because you knew yeah, in, in the world it. premiere, you would hear that song eight times All a day, day. Yeah. for seven days. Yeah. You know, they had the world premiere. They had a couple of other uh, uh, special times, the things yeah. that they named. Mm -hmm. But I noticed that every act that came on that thing would be playing eight times a day for seven days. So when ours came on, and there has not been one song that came on the world premiere that did not become a hit. So not only was it exciting to hear it on the radio, in that time slot on that program, 
but I knew it was going to be a hit. I mean, I mean, imagine what that's like for for guys that have been, you know, pardon the expression, expression busting their ass for several years prior to that. I mean, you know, we we worked hard and we would work on the weekends and places in the uh, tri-state area, mm -hmm. Canada, Utica, New York, Rochester, Buffalo, you know, and, and hear that, you know, as you are on the grind to pay your bills, and it comes on the radio, man, in a fantastic format. And, you know, I mean, of course I cried all the way in the subway uptown, you know what I mean, but this is what you asked for. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Wanda has a comment. This is my group. Had it, this huge crush on Larry. Still do. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. All right. So kind. Jonathan, do you have a, sh a story you would like to share? Mine started in New Orleans, Louisiana at a nightclub, playing nightclubs then. And uh, it was about 77. And um, a DJ there, as I'm setting up my drums to do the gig that night, they put on some cameo came on. I didn't know who he was. You know, the groove was so different than I'd ever heard in my life before. And the drum groove was like really, really unique and special. And I'd never heard anything like that. And I said, "Who is that?" I'm setting up. And then they played another song, a second song. I had to stop setting up and I had to go down and talk to the DJ. I said, "Who is that? Who's that playing?" That sounds incredible. It's amazing. And he said, "This is a group called Cameo. Cameo." I said, "Cameo? I never heard of them." He said, "Yeah, it's a new group coming out." And uh, I said, but this stuff is so innovative, it's so unique, and the drum grooves are just off the chain. I gotta get that stuff. Where do I get it? He said, well, it just came out. So fast forward to, I mean, to years later, I uh, work with the Jackson family, and then I uh, got off a tour, and then I'm um, sitting in my car, driving to the driveway, park, and Be Yourself came on, the radio. Oh, wow. And that groove was just unbelievable. It was so different, so fresh and unique. The sound of Cameo was always different from anything else you heard on the radio. And it was, it was just a bad song. Be Yourself was off the chain for the time. Like, wow, this is amazing. So I sat there, I'm grooving in the car, and then it went off, and I said, wow. And I had somebody with me, and they said, I said, wow, I would love to play with this band. I would love to play with the band. And they said, well, why don't you? I said, why don't you? I said, well, it's impossible. That's incredible. I mean, it's, it's, it's impossible because the leader of the band is the drummer. I'm going to play with them. <laughs> you know, I said, but I want to play with them so bad. This stuff, I can play this stuff. It's so funky. I can relate to it. And she said, well, wow, you know, so I said, yeah, so it's impossible, but I would love to play with them. So I go upstairs where I lived, and then about two weeks later, show you how God works and faith has it, mm -hmm. the phone rings, and my, uh, my person said, well, there's this guy on the phone named Larry, Larry Blackman. I said, Larry Blackman? And I said, he said, yes, we want to talk to you. So Larry gets on the phone and says, hey, Johnny, yeah, how you doing? We spoke a little bit. He said, yeah. I said, um, I saw you with the Jacksons at the Omni, I believe it was Omni in Atlanta. Yes. He said, yeah. and I said, Larry, I can't believe this is you. And I was excited. And um, he said, well, I'm calling to see if you want to play with Cameo. And I believe I said, well, how am I play with Cameo? You're the drummer. <laughs> and he started laughing. He said, no, no, I'm not playing anymore. I'm up front now. I'm, I'm fronting the group up front. He said, so I need, I love what you did with the Jacksons. I would love for you to work with me. And it was like a miraculous dream come true because I had just been saying at that club back in 77, I felt the music. <laughs> I felt what he was doing on the drums, and like, I, I feel this, I can do this. And I would love to play these grooves, you know, with the band, but I knew it was, Im I thought it was impossible, but God works in mysterious and proven yeah. 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 ways, and he worked it out for me. And then, um, like Larry said, I love you to work with me. I said, wow, this is amazing. And I said, okay, let's work. And then I think you said you needed me that next day. I was like, what? That's <laughs> that sounds about right. Always that. Sounds that. Like, well, always that. <laughs> so it was like yeah. a fulfillment of a dream. One of my heroes, and I love this work, and I super, super admired his, his work. His, his drumming was so innovative beyond anybody I'd ever heard, and especially in punk music. And um, it impressed me and it inspired me. I stopped learning this stuff. And uh, it was like a dream come true, like I said. You know, one of the miraculous things that happened in my life and career. And uh, here I am, some 30 something years later, Still, still under his wing. So, uh, <laughs> something I'm very proud of and very happy to be. And he does a hell of a job too. He does a hell of a job. I mean, it, it fits. You know, the puzzle of us all coming from different places, doing different types of music, and coming together here. And I think the requirement for people in cameo happens to be the character of the individual more than 
you know, first of all, we wouldn't call you if we didn't admire your, your talent in the first place. But uh, we've had some that, uh, that we've had to allow to go on their separate ways because here in this act, there's a uh, professional criteria, there's a level that we expect from everyone. And, uh, and it just, uh, you, when you're doing the right thing, it just works out. You know, it's not, it's not hard at all. But to play for one of your, and with and for one of your heroes is a great fulfillment and something I'm, I'm very grateful for. It's good, Jeff. Impressed you. Impressed you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on to Jeff. Yes, Thank sir. you so much, Did we Jonathan. give you enough time? <laughs> oh, I think so. Uh, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was my first tour with Cameo, and it was also uh, the first tour. Uh, John was busy with uh, the Jacksons or Madonna. I'm not sure who it was, but a 19-year-old John Blackwell Jr. was on tour with us, who, of course, was Prince's drummer for so very long. But this was his first thing. He was just green and and Johnny uh, John's dad asked if uh, I would keep an eye on him because he was young and I don't know why he picked me but uh, <laughs> he was a very forceful and determined man he said now I'm counting on you to take care of my boy and I'm like okay um, I wasn't very old myself um, but we were going from LA to Oakland on a bus and it was after you know after the show in LA and so it was overnight we stop in Kalinga, California. Now, I, no one knows where Kalinga, California is, but I happen to. Um, but anyway, we got off the bus. We were the only ones who got off the bus that morning. Well, the bus left without us. And they're on their, they're on their way. To, and Johnny starts to, he, go, he goes running outside and he's looking around. He says, they just playing, man. They, they'll be back. I said, no, no, John. They're, they're not. And this is before, you have to understand that no we all phones. didn't have cell phones then, you know. And I think we had one cell phone. It belonged to uh, our, our manager at the time, Forrest. Right. And he had the only cell phone. And we're on pay phones trying to reach Forrest. He's on, everyone's asleep on the bus. No one is oh. hearing. We're trying to. And so that's not working. John then says, well, I got to call my dad. I said, okay, and I give him the quarters, and he puts it, and he goes, Daddy, we got left off the bus. Here's Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> and he hands me the phone, here's and here's him going, what the bleepity blank flap is going on? What is going on? Uh, and I said, I, yeah, this, is, this is highly irregular, you know, it doesn't really happen. <laughs> At the same time, I'm thinking, we have a show in Oakland, and it's, you know, about 11 o'clock, no one's realized we're gone yet. Everyone's merrily going up to Oakland. And the drummer and the keyboard player are back here. We were able to, con we were trying to convince people to give us a ride to get to Fresno so we could catch a plane. To and so we're trying to talk to people and people are like, y'all let you cameo. <laughs> no, I swear. You know, we're trying to get, you know, and, and we're sitting there and John's like, boom. Oh, boop, boop. Yeah, we are, you know, and he's like, oh, sing, you know. Like, you know, so anyway, we were able to catch a ride in a semi-truck to the airport in Fresno. We then got on a four-seat plane, you know, flying like that. John is completely, out. he is in a fetal position, huddled in the back. He's so, we finally, we land in San Francisco, gigs in Oakland, then we get in a limousine, 120 miles across the San Mateo Bridge, like that. We literally walk out of the limo on the stage, and, it was, and the show's starting, and, and people are like, what happened to you guys? You know, like, wow. well, you know. Don't want to talk even, about it. I didn't even know about that. <laughs> <laughs> I know about the first part, the second part. Yeah, yeah. 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 Anyway, that was, yeah, that was you know, deal. welcome <laughs> to a life of touring. That yeah, was, right. yeah, when you started telling the story, Kat commented, oh no, don't tell the story. <laughs> uh, all right, well, we're running out of time, so Larry, do you have any final comments for the no, no, uh, viewers? We, we, we just like to give our appreciation for sticking with this act and believing in this act as well, you know, and having that bit of cameosis in your heart that, you know, made it necessary for you to find out what's happening with us. And, and to be along on this ride, it, it's, it's, it's been quite a journey, and, but we appreciate it very much. Absolutely. Uh, Peace. Yeah.
Yes, indeed. All right. Thank you, Cameo. Thank you.